So ladies and gentlemen, today on Sports Follow, we're going to be looking at the first of a three-part series we're going to be doing on the, uh, the Oakland A's dynasty of the mid-1970s. Now we're going to start with the 1972 season where the team's coaching led them to uh, victory in the ALCS and the World Series, despite the fact they didn't have a, as much of a great lineup as a lot of people remember. Now you gotta understand the early 1970s were kind of a change time for the Major League Baseball. Now in 1971, uh, Oakland made it as far as the ALCS, but couldn't uh, find a way to uh, knock off Baltimore. Even though Baltimore uh, was a, still a strong team, a lot of people thought Oakland had a good chance to beat them, but it didn't pan out. Now in the 1972 season, entering there, uh, the A's felt they needed another big starter and he, uh, he dropped uh, a bombshell for their fans and the Cubs as well by picking up that uh, great starter Ken Holtzman from Chicago for the, uh, the hero Rick Monday. And Monday at the time was more well known for uh, saving American flag from a, uh, a protester. But like I said, uh, you know, he was a good utility player, good outfielder, you know, killed Montreal in the playoffs uh, 10 years later. but. A lot of people felt it was a steal. Now, the end of the regular season with a 93 uh, win, 62 loss season. And um, the regular season was kind of weird to start with because the A's under, uh, you know, their, their, their different owner, Charlie Finley, started beginning wearing solid green or solid gold jerseys with contrasting white pants. And they were a very decorative team, and that's why I started watching them because they just looked so great because. We have a theory in baseball, especially the Rescue Genemy Baseball League, if you uh, look great, you play great, and that's what they did that year. Now, uh, most Major League Baseball teams at the time wore all, all white uniforms at home and all gray ones at the road, and um, these uniforms actually more like look like softball uniforms and were considered a radical departure. And the other uh, thing was that Finley believed these team needed a certain look, so he offered a mustache day promotion. Finley offered $500 American, which was big money at the time, to any player who grew a mustache by Father's Day. Uh, and this was at a time when a lot of teams, including their opponents in the World Series, Cincinnati Reds, uh, you know, forbade uh, facial hair. Uh, and when Father's Day arrived, every member of the team grew a mustache and received a bonus. And I think that's the, one of the best $10,000 investment, I think, in uh, all time. Now, another uh, departure too was that uh, up until that season, uh, the Oakland Athletics were named officially the Oakland Athletics, but this year uh, Finley had uh, successfully lobbied the league to go with the terminology A's. And uh, Charlie Finley believed, which I tend to agree, one of the few times I believe with him, that the previous owner of the Athletics when in Philadelphia was Connie Mack, and uh, he felt you know, that was associated with the old fashioned version of the Athletics and the A's would be like, you know, the swinging A's uh, that would be, uh, you know, in, uh, in prominence. Now, but at the end of regular season, uh, they won by six and a half games with a really impressive uh, home record of 48 wins, 29 losses, 93-62 record for that year. Only Chicago uh, with their competition that year, but Dick Allen and the rest of the team weren't strong enough for Oakland. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a situation where they needed to, uh, you know, split the season series with Chicago to take the banner for a second time, and that's what he did. Now, uh, uh, Oakland had some great starters on the team that year uh, and top players. If you look at the, the pitching staff, you had Vida Blue, Rolly Fingles, Fingers, Dave Hamilton, Holtzman, like I mentioned, Catfish Hunter, Daryl Knowles, Bob Locker, Blue Moon Odom. So they had a really balanced, balanced pitching attack, and I think that's what got them through. Now, uh, Dave Duncan and uh, Gene Tennis were sharing catching duties, two very uh, quality players. Actually, tennis came along, uh, straightened the playoffs better than a lot of people expected. Now, in the infield, of course, we had Sal Bando, Burke Campanaris, Mike Epstein, and Dick Green, which is, uh, are as good as any four players in, um, in Oakland history. Now, the outfielders, of course, you had uh, Georgie Hendricks, Reggie Jackson, Angel, Angel Manuel, Joe Rudy, and Matty Alou. Again, you can see the platoon aspect that uh, Oakland had going on. Now, uh, D.H. He did pick up Cepeda late in the season, but it was more of a split duty for most of the um, uh, most of the year. Now, 
Reggie Jackson was the, was the, the straw that stirred the drink, and the time they got in the playoffs against Detroit, it really paid off because uh, the first two games of Detroit at home, they won 3-2 and 5 nothing. Now, they did lose game four in Tiger Stadium 3 nothing, and he did have a chance to wrap up the series in game four, leading 3-1 uh, to one going into the bottom of the 10th inning. But some bad decisions and bad play by Oakland allowed uh, Detroit to make a massive comeback, and he won 4-3 uh, in the bottom of the 10th. Now, but if the time game five uh, came around, uh, we knew there was going to be something happening, and this, this we saw. Uh, Williams always tried uh, trick plays like double steals, and unfortunately, he already paid for it. He decided to uh, have Reggie Jackson steal home on a double steal, and what Jackson did, he severely injured himself. It did uh, tie up the game 1-1, and uh, but he paid for it because Jackson was unavailable for the rest of the playoffs, including the World Series. Now, with the fourth inning, George Hendricks scored uh, the Gore ahead run in a game that was more defensive than anything else. But another great performance by Blue Moon Odom, who won his second game of the uh, series, allowed uh, Oakland to advance. Now, in the World Series, a lot of people gave Oakland only a, a small chance of beating uh, beating Cincinnati. And uh, game one, though, was at Riverfront Stadium, and Oakland s uh, squeaked out a very, very uh, tough 3-2 decision. And by the time game two came or came along, it was the same thing where Oakland would, uh, you know, hold uh, Cincinnati at bay and batting and defensively. Game two, they won 2-1. Two and at this time, a lot of people were shocked that Oakland was even uh, ahead two games in the series. And by, by the time uh, game uh, three ca came, or came around in Oakland, Cincinnati had no choice but to win that contest. And uh, Jack Billingham actually had his one of his best career games to allow Oakland to uh, be held at bay and allowed Cincinnati to get back in the series. Now, game four at Alameda was uh, a tremendously, tremendously important game for Oakland, and uh, I tell you why. Cincinnati had dominated most of the game. Uh, they were leading actually 2 nothing entering the ninth, but a whole bunch of role players for uh, Oakland uh, did the damage. In the bottom of the ninth, they got four consecutive hits. Pinchinger, Godzilla, Marquez singled. Then Tennis got another single. Don Minchner was picked up in a trade just week, uh, months before, followed with another pinch hit single. And uh, uh, pinch runner Alan Lewis came in to tie the game. And the third pinch enter, Angel Manguel, a very money player, uh, single off Clay Carroll, to uh, score tennis with a game winner and put the Oakland up three games to one. Now this was the first time that in World Series history that a team collected three consecutive pinch hits in the same World Series inning. So it was a, it was a, a marquee game. But game five with uh, Oakland having a chance to uh, knock Cincinnati off, they were leading 4-1 after the fourth inning, and, uh, but they couldn't stop uh, Cincinnati's comeback as he scored in the 4-2, um, uh, actually after four, he scored in the fifth, seven, uh, fifth, eighth, and ninth to go ahead. Now, he did have a chance to tie the game, but unfortunately, uh, uh, Joe Morgan threw out uh, pinch rudder blue moon modem at the plate, to end the contest. They were at first and third uh, before Campaneers came out and hit that foul pop, but uh, you know, it didn't uh, it didn't bode well for uh, Oakland to send Blue Moon Odom because you know, he was a good runner, but he wasn't a speed merchant like Al Lewis. Said. Now game six uh, back in uh, Cincinnati, the uh, Cincinnati bats <coughs> went to work. They uh, scored eight runs, including fifth, five and the seventh, including uh, 10 hits. Yeah, but uh, of course the, the big players, Dave Concepcion, Tony Perez, Joe Morgan, and uh, Bobby Tolan Cesar Geronimo hit key RBIs and RBI, uh, uh, double RBIs to allow Cincinnati to win. And Ross Grimsley had a really good performance. The future Expo really showed his uh, young talent in the contest. Now game seven, uh, which a lot of people considered probably one of the best World Series games of all time. Oakland took an early one nothing lead on the great pitching of, uh, of the Catfish Hunter. But uh, what happened with uh, Cincinnati, they had, uh, didn't have uh, really uh, uh, strong uh, strong uh, hopes on the relief corps, including Pedro Babon, who was caught for the, uh, uh, the loss here. 
and uh, Oakland scored two goals in the sixth to kind of seal the deal. Although Cincinnati scored one run in the eighth, it was a it was a low hitting, great pitching game. But the big hero of the the whole series, of course, was uh, catcher Gene Tennis, who uh, cracked numerous key home runs and RBIs in the whole contest, and he was named uh, MVP. Tennis's uh, performance kind of gave uh, hope to you know secondary players in the regular season you know that if they can make the playoffs they can show their skill now actually Cincinnati outscored uh, Oakland 21-16 uh, in the series or even in hits but what where Oakland really really came to the fore they were scoring a lot of um, runs early on in the middle innings now that year of course was a change as well because uh, this was Al Michaels uh, first World Series as a play-by-play -play man and he was the broadcaster for the Reds and uh, what was funny about this the rule changed he didn't call another World Series in 1979 and Al Michaels or really uh, you know uh, showed his uh, broadcasting teeth in the series I heard somebody's called some great uh, calls of the Cincinnati victories he seemed to be a homer then but like I said most announcers were now the takeaways that I have because I only got into Oakland heavily in the 73 season it just the way the team looked, the way the team played, Oakland had a swagger amongst them. And to go against a team like the Reds who were loaded with talent, Bench and Perez and Morgan and Rose and Dolan and Dennis Menke and all these great players, they weren't ready to be the great, uh, you know, the big May Red machine. you got to remember two years before with a different kind of a different lineup, Cincinnati was uh, upset by the Orioles. Uh, Carbo was with them at the time. I talked to Bertie Carbo years ago and said, you know, we just weren't ready in 1970. But the Brigman Red Machine in 75 76, losing to Oakland gave them an incentive to try to not just rely on talent. He had to get the role players involved. And, um, you know, Pete Rose said it best, you're only good as your last player in Cincinnati. And the 75 and 76 teams, sure, were loaded with talent, but they had the, uh, you know, the, the, the role players that uh, could stir the drink. Now, for any Oakland fan out there, the only thing I can say about the the team back then is compared to, I don't know, the, the, the triple World Series team of 88, 89, and 90. This was a team that overachieved. Uh, they did have talent, sure, but it was like platoon system. They had good defense, good offense, good pitching. The relief core, how they manipulated the uh, rolly fingers and used Vita Blue in relief in certain games. And, you know, uh, most of the players had the experience, especially Ken Holtzman. You know, he was in the um, the 69 pennant race with Chicago. He had a good season. He seemed to know what he was doing. And Holtzman, to me, uh, Jackson was strong. And losing Jackson in the playoffs could have made him lose. But the pitching stepped up. Hunter, Fingers, Daryl Knowles, who pitched all seven games. So overall, I think uh, that the 1972 A's were overachievers. And it was the first time we saw maybe that of the modern uh, Major League Baseball we enjoyed into the late 70s, early 80s. The great uh, talent, but the good role players who would come in, pinch run, late substitute. But, uh, you know, Cincinnati could have easily won four World Series in the 1970s, being the team of the decade, but just factors at the time. I don't think the teams were playing in the National League were strong enough. They gave them enough incentive to, to learn how to beat a team like Oakland, because Oakland uh, was a team run by a madman, but most of the players knew how to play by for a madman. But when Charlie Finley started dismantling the team in 75, you know, in their last title year. But imagine this, they won five straight titles in the 70s, 71 to 75. And most of their opponents were extremely, extremely talented in the American League. And I, that's why I still think the AL was a stronger league in the 70s, despite Cincinnati winning and Pittsburgh winning in 79, and excuse me, 71, 79. But for me, the AL was a stronger league, but that's just my opinion. So. So on this uh, beautiful uh, Tuesday in the Meductic region, we're telling everybody to be safe with the floods, watch the highway barricades. We want to tell everybody that if you do have a chance to watch it on YouTube, there's a lot of uh, 1972 World Series stuff still out there. Part two, we'll talk about uh, the Oakland A's facing the Mets in the 73 World Series. Of course, 74 uh, facing that great Dodger team and uh, defeating them in both uh, occasions, the Mets and the Dodgers. So I'm not giving it too much tail out of uh, out of school as we say but uh, but I'm an Oakland A's fan always will be because you gotta love the white jerseys the white hats and the mustaches you have to you know I'm a 70s boy what can I say
Have a good day.